Hi, I'm Stormy Omardian, and this is episode one, Praying for God to Empower Your Prayers. Now, first of all, let me make it perfectly clear that the power of a praying wife is not a means of gaining control over your husband. So don't get your hopes up. In fact, it's the opposite. It's laying down all claim to power in and of yourself and relying on God's power to transform you, your husband, your circumstances, and your marriage. It's a way God's power works through prayers, prayed from a right heart in Jesus' name. That means praying for your husband's greatest blessing, which is ultimately yours too. When my husband Michael and I were first married, and differences arose between us, praying was definitely not my first thought. In fact, it was closer to a last resort. I tried other methods first, such as you know, arguing or pleading, ignoring, avoiding, confronting, debating, and of course the ever popular silent treatment, all with far less satisfying results than I had hoped. It took some time to realize that by praying first, these unpleasant methods of operation could be avoided. Prayer is far more powerful than contention. Probably, by the time you hear this, Michael and I will have been married over 50 years. This is nothing less than miraculous. It's certainly not a testimony to our greatness, but to God's faithfulness to answer prayer. I confess that even after all these years, I am still learning about this, and it doesn't come easy. While I may not have as much practice doing it right as I have had doing it wrong, I can say without reservation that prayer works. Unfortunately, I didn't learn how to really pray for my husband until I started praying for my children. As I saw amazing answers to prayer for them, I decided to try being just as detailed and fervent in praying for him. But I found that praying for children is far easier. From the moment we lay eyes on them, we want the best for their lives unconditionally, wholeheartedly, without question. But with a husband, it's often not that simple, especially for someone who's been married a while. A husband can hurt your feelings, be inconsiderate, uncaring, abusive, irritating, or negligent. He can say or do things that pierce your heart like a sliver. And every time you start to pray for him, you find the sliver festering. It's obvious you can't give yourself to praying the way God wants you to until you are rid of all that. Praying for your husband is not the same as praying for a child because you're not your husband's mother. We have authority over our children that is given to us by the Lord. We don't have authority over our husbands. However, we have been given authority over all the power of the enemy. It says that in Luke 10, 19. And we can do great damage to the enemy's plans when we pray. Many difficult things that happen in a marriage relationship are actually part of the enemy's plan set up for its demise. But we can say, I will not allow anything to destroy my marriage and mean it. I will not stand by and watch my husband be wearied, beaten down, or destroyed. I will not sit idle while an invisible wall goes up between us. I will not allow confusion or miscommunication or wrong attitudes and bad choices to erode what we are trying to build together. I will not tolerate hurt and unforgiveness leading us to divorce. We can take a stand against 
any negative influences in our marriage relationship and know that God has given us authority in his name to back it up. Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's from Matthew 18, 18. You have authority in the name of Jesus to stop evil and permit good. You can submit to God in prayer whatever controls your husband, such as alcoholism, workaholism, laziness, depression, infirmity, abusiveness, anxiety, fear, anger, or failure, and pray for him to be released from it. That doesn't mean it all happens instantly. We're dealing with another person and his own will here. I confess right now that there was a time when I considered separation or divorce. This is an embarrassing disclosure because I don't believe in either of those options that it's the best answer to a troubled marriage. I believe in God's position on divorce. He says it's not right and it grieves him. The last thing I want to do is grieve God, but I know what it's like to feel the kind of despair that paralyzes good decision making. I've experienced the degree of hopelessness that causes a person to give up on trying to do what's right. I understand the torture of loneliness that leaves you longing for anyone who will look into your soul and see you. I felt pain so bad that the fear of dying from it propelled me to seek out the only immediately foreseeable means of survival, escape from the source of misery. I know what it's like to contemplate acts of desperation because you see no future. I've experienced such a buildup of negative emotions day after day that separation and divorce seemed like nothing more than the promise of pleasant relief. The biggest problem I faced in our marriage was my husband's temper. The only ones who were ever the object of his anger were me and the children. He used words like weapons that left me crippled or paralyzed. I'm not saying that I was without fault, quite the contrary. I was sure I was as much to blame as he, but I didn't know what to do about it. I pleaded with God on a regular basis to make my husband more sensitive, less angry, more pleasant, less irritable, but I saw few changes. Was God not listening? Or did he favor the husband over the wife as I suspected? After a number of years with little change, I cried out to the Lord one day in despair saying, God, I cannot live this way anymore. I know what you said about divorce, but I can't live in the same house with him. Help me, Lord. I sat on the bed holding my Bible for hours as I struggled with the strongest desire to take the children and leave. I believe that because I came to God in total honesty about what I felt, he allowed me to thoroughly and clearly envision what life would be like if I left. Where would I live? How I would support myself and care for the children who would still be my friends. And worst of all, how a heritage of divorce would affect my son and daughter. It was the most horrible and unspeakably sad picture. If I left, I would find some relief, but at the price of everything dear to me, I knew it wasn't God's plan for us. And as I sat there, God also impressed upon my heart that if I would deliberately lay down my life before his throne, die to my desire to leave and give my needs to the Lord. He would teach me how to lay down my life in prayer for Michael. He would show me how to really intercede for him as a child of God. 
And in the process, God would pour his blessings out on both of us and revive our marriage. We would be better together if we could just get past this than we could ever be separated and alone. He showed me that Michael was caught in a web from his past that rendered him incapable of being different from what he was at that moment. But God would use me as an instrument of his deliverance if I would consent to it. And it hurt to say yes. But when I did, I felt hopeful for the first time in years. I began to pray every day for Michael, like I never prayed before. Each time, though, I had to confess my own hardness of heart. I saw how deeply hurt and unforgiving of him I was. I don't want to pray for him, I thought. I don't want to ask God to bless him. I only want God to strike his heart with conviction of how cruel he's been. I had to say over and over, God, I confess my unforgiveness toward my husband. Deliver me from all of it. And little by little, I began to see changes occur in both of us. When Michael became angry, instead of reacting negatively, I prayed for him. I asked God to give me insight into what was causing his rage, and he did. I asked him what I could do to make things better, and he showed me. My husband's anger became less frequent and more quickly soothed. Every day, prayer built something positive. We're still not perfected, but we've come a long way. It hasn't been easy, yet I'm convinced that God's way is worth the effort it takes to walk in it. It's the only way to save a marriage. A wife's prayers for her husband have a far greater effect on him than anyone else's, even his mother's. Sorry, Mom. Um, a mother's prayers for her child are certainly fervent, but when a man marries, he leaves his father and mother and becomes one with his wife. It says that in Matthew 19, 5. The same is true for his wife. At least it's supposed to be that way. They are supposed to be a team, unified in spirit. The strength of a man and wife joined together in God's sight is far greater than the sum of the strengths of each of the two individuals. That's because the Holy Spirit unites them and gives them added power to their prayers. I need to tell you at this point that God does not say in his word that a wife has to suffer abuse or allow there to be any danger to herself or her children inflicted by her husband. If that is happening to you, you must get help from people you trust. Do not try to do this by yourself. If your husband puts you or your children in danger in any way, he needs professional help. But ask God to lead you to find good people who can guide you to get help for yourself and your children first. In every broken marriage, there is at least one person whose heart is hard against God. When a heart becomes hard, there is no vision from God's perspective. When we're miserable in a marriage, we feel that anything will be an improvement over what we're experiencing. But we don't see the whole picture. We only see the way it is, not the way God wants it to become. When we pray, however, our hearts become soft toward God, and we get a vision. We see there is hope. We have faith that he will restore all that has been devoured and destroyed or eaten away from the marriage. And God says in Joel 2.25, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. And we can trust him to take away the pain, the hopelessness, the hardness, and the unforgiveness. We become able to envision God's ability to resurrect love and life from the deadest of places. 
Imagine Mary Magdalene's joy when she went to Jesus' tomb the third day after he had been crucified and found that he was not dead after all, but had been raised up by the power of God. The joy of seeing something hopelessly dead brought to life is the greatest joy we can know. And the power that resurrected Jesus is the very same power that will resurrect the dead places of your marriage and put life back into it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6.14 that God has both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. It's the only power that can. But it doesn't happen without a heart for God that is willing to gut it out in prayer and grow through the tough times and wait for love to be resurrected. We have to go through the pain to get to the joy. You have to decide if you want your marriage to work, if you want it badly enough to do whatever is necessary within healthy parameters, of course, to see it happen. You have to believe the part of your relationship that has been eaten away by pain and indifference and selfishness can be restored. You have to know that whatever has crept into your relationship so silently and stealthily as to not even be perceived as a threat until it is clearly present can be removed. You have to trust that God is big enough to accomplish all this and more. If you experience a silent withdrawal from one another's lives that severs all emotional connection, if you sense a relentless draining away of love and hope, if your relationship is in so bottomless a pit of hurt and anger that every day sends you deeper into despair, if every word spoken drives a wedge further between you until it becomes an impenetrable barrier, keeping you miles apart. Be assured that none of the above is God's will for your marriage. God's will is to break down all those barriers and lift you out of that pit. He can heal the wounds and put love back in your heart, and nothing and no one else can do that. Would you pray with me about this? Lord, I pray that you would make our marriage all you want it to be. Bring an end to any conflict between us, between me and my husband. Break any old habits of relating to each other that don't glorify you. Remove all strife. Change our hearts. Break the hold strife has on us. Take away any hurt we've allowed to become a wall between us in order to protect ourselves. Lift us out of any pit of unforgiveness we've allowed. Speak through us so that our words reflect your love, peace, and reconciliation toward each other. Tear down any wall of separation between us. Enable us to move into the healing and wholeness you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Now, don't write off your marriage. Ask God to give you a new husband. God is able to take the one you have and make him a new creation in Christ. Husband and wives are not destined to fight, emotionally disconnect, or live in marital deadness, or just be miserable or divorce. We have God's power on our side. You don't have to leave your marriage to chance. You can fight for it in prayer and not give up because as long as we are praying, there is hope. With God, nothing is ever as dead as it seems, not even your own feelings. Mm -hmm.